The most anticipated witness was J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the White Star Line and himself a first-class passenger aboard the ship. Ismay's father co-founded the White Star Line in the late 1800s. Later on, when the company was sold to J. Pierpont Morgan in 1900, an agreement was reached whereby Ismay would continue on as managing director and chairman. Before he testified at the hearing, Ismay had been vilified by the international press as a coward for having saved himself while hundreds of women and children went to a watery grave. I will ask you a few preliminary questions. First, state your full name, please. Joseph Bruce Ismay. And your place of residence? Liverpool. And your age? I shall be 50 on the 12th of December. And your occupation? Ship owner. Are you an officer of the White Star Line? I am. In what capacity? Managing director. As such an officer, were you officially designated to make the trial trip of the Titanic? No. Were you a voluntary passenger? A voluntary passenger, yes. Will you kindly tell the committee the circumstances surrounding your voyage and as succinctly as possible? Beginning with your going aboard the vessel at Liverpool, your place on the ship on the voyage, together with any circumstances you feel would be helpful to us in this inquiry. In the first place, sir, I would like to express my sincere grief at this deplorable catastrophe. I understand that you gentlemen have been appointed by the Senate to inquire into the circumstances. So far as we are concerned, we welcome it. We court the fullest inquiry. We have nothing to conceal, nothing to hide. The ship was built in Belfast. She was the latest thing in the art of shipbuilding. Absolutely no money was spared in her construction. She was not built by contract. She was simply built on a commission. She underwent her trials, which were entirely satisfactory. She then proceeded to Southampton, arriving there on Wednesday. Will you describe the trials she went through? She left Southampton at 12 o'clock. She arrived in Cherbourg that evening, having run over at 68 revolutions. We ran from Cherbourg to Queenstown at 70 revolutions. After embarking the mails and passengers, we proceeded at 70 revolutions. I'm not absolutely sure what the first day's run was, whether it was 464 miles or 484 miles. The second day, the number of revolutions was increased. I think the number of revolutions on the second day was about 72. I think we ran the second day 519 miles. The third day, revolutions were increased to 75, and I think we ran 546 or 549 miles. The accident took place on Sunday night. What the exact time was, I do not know. I was in bed myself, asleep, when the accident happened. The ship sank, I'm told, at 2.20. I understand that it has been stated that the ship was going at full speed. The ship never had been at full speed. The full speed of the ship is 78 revolutions. She works up to 80. So far as I'm aware, she never exceeded 75 revolutions. She had not all her boilers on. It was our intention, if we had fine weather on Monday afternoon or Tuesday, to drive the ship at full speed. That, owing to the unfortunate catastrophe, never eventuated. Will you describe what you did after the impact or collision? I presume the impact awakened me. I lay in my bed for a moment or two afterwards, not realizing, probably, what had happened. Eventually, I walked along the passageway and met one of the stewards and said, What has happened? He said, I do not know, sir. I then went back into my room, put on my coat, and went up to the bridge, where I found Captain Smith. I asked him what had happened, and he said, We have struck ice. I said, Do you think the ship is seriously damaged? He said, I'm afraid she is. I then went down below. I think it was where I met Mr. Bell, the chief engineer, who was in the main companionway, I asked if the ship was seriously damaged, and he said he thought she was, but was quite satisfied the pumps would keep her afloat. I think I went back into the bridge. I heard the order to get the boats out. I stood upon the deck practically until I left the ship in the starboard collapsible boat, which is the last boat to leave the ship, so far as I know. More than that, I do not know. Did the captain remain on the bridge? And that I could not tell you, sir. Did you leave him on the bridge? Yes, sir. His statement to you was that he felt she was seriously damaged? Yes, sir. And the next statement of the chief engineer was what? To the same effect. You say that the trip was a voluntary trip on your part? Absolutely. For the purpose of viewing this ship in action, or did you have some business in New York? 
I had no business to bring me to New York at all. I simply came in the natural course of events, as one is apt to in the case of a new ship, to see how she works, and with the idea of seeing how we could improve on her for the next ship which we were building. Were there any other executive officers of the company aboard? None. Was the inspector or builder on board? There was a representative of the builders on board. Who was he? Mr. Thomas Andrews. In what capacity was he? As a representative of the builders to see that everything was working satisfactorily and also to see how he could improve the next ship. Was he a man of large experience? Yes, he was. Was he among the survivors? Unfortunately, no. Did you have the occasion to consult with the captain about the movements of the ship? Never. Did he consult you about it? Never. Perhaps I'm wrong in saying that. I should like to say this. I do not know that it was quite a matter of consulting him about it or of his consulting me about it, but what we had arranged to do was that we would not attempt to arrive in New York at the lightship before 5 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Was it supposed that you could reach New York at the time without putting the ship to its full running capacity? Oh, yes, sir. There was nothing to be gained by arriving in New York any earlier than that. You spoke of the revolutions on the early part of the voyage. Those were increased as the distance was increased? The Titanic being a new ship, we were gradually working it up. When you bring out a new ship, you naturally do not start her running at full speed until you get everything working smoothly and satisfactorily down below. During the voyage, did you know of your own knowledge of your proximity to icebergs? Uh, no, sir, I did not. I know ice had been reported, though. Ice had been reported? Yes. Do you know anything about a wireless message from the America to the Titanic, saying that the America had encountered ice in that latitude? No, sir, I do not. Were you aware of the proximity of icebergs on Sunday? On Sunday, no. I did not know on Sunday. I knew that we would be in the ice region that night sometime. That you would be or were? That we would be in the ice region on Sunday night. Did you have any consultation regarding the matter? Absolutely none. Or with any other officer of the ship? With no officer at all, sir. It was absolutely out of my province. I am not a navigator. I was simply a passenger on board the ship. Were you outside on the deck when the order was given to lower the lifeboats? I heard Captain Smith give the order when I was on the bridge. You heard the captain give the order? Yes, sir. Will you tell us what he said? Well, it's rather difficult for me to remember exactly what was said, sir. As nearly as you can. I know I heard him give the order to lower the boats. I think that is all he said. I think he simply turned around and gave the order. Was there anything else he said as to how they should be manned or occupied? No, sir, not that I heard. As soon as I heard him give the order to lower the boats, I left the bridge. You left the bridge? Yes. Did you see any of the boats lowered? Yes, sir. How many? Certainly three. Will you tell us, if you can, how they were lowered? They were swung out, people were put into the boats from the deck, and then they were simply lowered away down to the water. Was there any order or supervision exercised by the officers of the ship in loading these lifeboats? Yes, sir. They first put men into the boats for the purpose of controlling them? We put in some of the ship's people. In the boat in which you left the ship, how many men were on board? Four. As they were loaded, was any order given as to how they should be loaded? No. How did it happen that the women were first put aboard these lifeboats? The natural order would be women and children first. That was followed? As far as practical. And were all the women and children accommodated in these lifeboats? I could not tell you, sir. How many passengers were in the lifeboat in which you left the ship? I should think about 45. Was that its full capacity? Practically. Was there any struggle or jostling or any attempts by men to get into the boats? I saw none. Were children shown the same consideration as the women? Absolutely. How long were you on the ship after the collision occurred? I think it was an hour and a quarter. What were the circumstances of your departure from the ship? The boat was there. There was a certain number of men in the boat, and the officer called out asking if there were any more women, and there was no response. And there were no passengers left on the deck. There were no passengers on the deck? No, sir, and as the boat was in the act of being lowered away, I got into it. Was there any attempt, as this boat was being lowered past the other decks, to have you take on more passengers? None, sir. There were no passengers there to take on. How long were you in the open sea in this lifeboat? I should think about four hours. Were all the lifeboats of one type? No, there were four that are called collapsible boats. How many were there? I think there were 20 altogether. Including both designs? 
Yes, 16 wooden boats and four collapsible boats. Mr. Ismay, what can you say about the sinking and disappearance of the ship? Can you describe the manner in which she went down? I did not see her go down. How far were you from the ship? I do not know how far we were away. I was sitting with my back to the ship. I was rowing all the time I was in the boat. We were pulling away. Did you not care to see her go down? No, and I'm glad I did not. Can you tell us anything about the inspection and certification that was made and issued before sailing? The ship receives a Board of Trade passenger certificate. Otherwise, she would not be allowed to carry passengers. Do you know whether that was done? You could not sail your ship without it, sir. You could not get your clearance. Do you know whether the ship was equipped with a full complement of lifeboats? If she had not been, sir, she could not have sailed. She would not have received a passenger certificate. Therefore, she must have been fully equipped. Do you know what water capacity there was on the ship? I mean, when she stove in, how many compartments could be flooded with safety? The ship was specially constructed so that she would float with any two compartments full of water. I think I'm right in saying that there are very few ships, but perhaps I'd better not say that. But I will continue now that I've begun it. I believe there are very few ships today of which the same can be said. When we built the Titanic, we had that especially in mind. If this ship had hit the iceberg stem on, in all human probability, she would have been here today. If she had hit the iceberg head on, in all probability she would be here now? I say in all human probability that ship would have been afloat today. I understood you to say a little while ago that you were rowing with your back to the ship. If you were rowing and going away from the ship, you would naturally be facing the ship, would you not? No, not at all. In these boats, some row facing the bow of the boat and some facing the stern. I was seated with my back to the man who was steering so that I was facing away from the ship. Judging from the messages, it was your intention to return the night you landed, if possible, to Liverpool? Yes, sir. At that time, you understand, I had not the slightest idea there was going to be any investigation of this sort. Do you know whether they were? That was a matter for the builder, sir, and I presume that they were fulfilling all the requirements of the Board of Trade. How is the apportionment of lifeboats made, do you know? I do not know of my own knowledge, but I'm convinced that they must have done so, because otherwise the ship never could have left port. Is it made on tonnage? It is based on tonnage. On tonnage entirely? On tonnage entirely, I believe, yes. That would not include passenger capacity? No, sir. Let me ask you, Mr. Ismay whether in view of this experience you have just gone through, you would consider it desirable to have the appointment of lifeboats based on passenger capacity rather than tonnage? I think that the result of this horrible accident is that the whole question of life-saving appliances on board vessels and ships will be very carefully gone through and receive the most full and careful consideration to see what is the best thing to be done. Had the Titanic carried double the number of lifeboats or treble the number of lifeboats, do you consider that there might have been an increase in the number of passengers and crew saved? I think that is quite possible, sir. I do not want to commit your company, and I presume I will not do so by this inquiry. But in the view of all that has occurred, are you willing to say that the proportion of lifeboats should be increased to more approximately meet such exigencies as you have just passed through? I think having regard to our experience, there is no question that that should be done but I think it may be quite possible to improve on the construction of the ship. Have you given any instructions to increase the lifeboat capacity of other White Star ships? We have given instructions that no ship belonging to the IMM company is to leave any port unless she has sufficient boats on board for the accommodation of all passengers and the whole of the crew. But by that course, you exceed the requirements of the regulations of the British Board of Trade. Absolutely. Our ships all now conform to the Board of Trade regulations without putting the additional boats on. I understand that, but you evidently do not regard the regulation of the British Board of Trade as sufficient to protect the lives of your passengers. Not after our unfortunate experience, sir, that is so. Not desiring to be impertinent at all, but in order that I may not be charged with omitting to do my duty, I would like to know where you went after you boarded the Carpathia and how you happened to go there. Mr. Chairman, I understand that my behavior on board the Titanic and subsequently on board the Carpathia has been very severely criticized. I want to court the fullest inquiry, and I place myself unreservedly in the hands of yourself and any of your colleagues to ask me any questions in regard to my conduct. So please do not hesitate to do so, and I will answer them in the best of my ability. In view of your statement, I desire to say that I have seen none of these comments 
to which you refer. In fact, I have not read the newspaper since I started for New York. I have deliberately avoided it. So I have seen none of these reports. And you do understand that I have not made any criticism of your conduct aboard the Carpathia. No, sir, on the contrary, I do not say that anybody has, but I'm here to answer any questions in regard thereto. What can you say, Mr. Ismay, as to your treatment at the hands of the committee since you have been under our direction? I have no fault to find. Naturally, I was disappointed in not being allowed to go home, but I feel quite satisfied. You have some very good reason in your own mind. You quite agree now that it was the wisest thing to do? I think under the circumstances it was, yes. And even in my refusal to permit you to go, you saw no discourtesy? Uh, certainly not, sir. Do you know of any unfair or discourteous or inconsiderate treatment upon the part of the committee of any of your officers connected with this investigation? No, I do not. Not the slightest.